a warm welcome back to this program, Think Tech Hawaii, and this show, Human Humane Architecture. This happening to be the 346th show, and you're now way past our 20,000 viewers, somewhere in the 20,400s. We appreciate that. And uh, we is today back on the panel, uh, Pedro Capriata via Barcelona, Martin Ansolini via here in Honolulu, Hawaii, me, Martin Despang, same thing, and Jay Fidel behind all that and producing us. So welcoming us back. We want to say this is the first show aired after our presidential election here in the United States of America or the ununited states to be of America, or however you want to look at it. So the question is, do we do business as usual? I suggest here uh, no and yes, yes and no, because I think we should position ourselves in, in that context. And I want to start out, guys, to extend uh, a thank you to the ones we don't see, but he hears us, which is Jay, because he keeps allowing us to do that. And it seems to me uh, it's more important than ever to stay uh, you know, vocal, and to um, be the la resistance, as the French, who we don't have any here, but uh, we got Spanish here, two of you, but uh, as they call it. And so th that is more important than ever. And Jay, I remember when you were some moons ago, uh, you were very upset uh, when uh, public radio had uh, former Vice President Pence as a panelist, and he wasn't answering the questions. And you said, if I would be the host, I would give this guy some warnings and then I would kick him out. But you said, I understand why they can't do this because they're publicly funded. And so you had sympathy and empathy for the colleagues, but at the same time you were, you were angry. So I, Jay, I believe you're, and this is kind of mean because you can't really respond, but you do after the fact when you're off the producer or chair there. And I think your think tech transitioning was very ahead of, you know, seeing what's happening because in the previous one, they were underwriters and they were sympathetic. But for example, human and architecture was stepping on the toes of Kamehameha school left and right. And they were an underwriter. And now uh, that you still need funding for keeping things running, but you kept it sort of shorter. So to avoid that sort of, um, you know, corruption, that happened, by the way, tragically to the Washington Post, which was the one that took uh, Nixon down through Bob Woodward. And now Bezos uh, basically said, oh, no, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to endorse. We're just going to stay out of things. So thanks, Jay, for keeping that up uh, and being more powerful than the Bezoses and the Musks and the Zuckerbergs. And uh, just keep the criticality up. Is is that fair to say, guys? How do you look at that? Yeah, I, you I would just add that uh, initiatives as think tech are the initiatives that uh, we're talking with Martin about grassroots organizations, no? what people is doing no? in their everyday lives. No? Life will go on. The institutions of this country are fantastic. Fantastic, and the institutions are not just the one that are under the power of Donald Trump now. Very, very vertical power on his on the structure after the election that was very overwhelming. But other institutions, as think tech, no, that are doing things that are reflecting people's thoughts, that are creating uh, a community uh, and also uh, uh, affecting, in in some cases, directly people's lives. Pedro, how how do you personally and maybe your your fellow um, you know Peruvian and and Barcelonian people, how are you looking at us over here? Well, I I haven't experienced uh, these extreme situations firsthand here in Barcelona, fortunately. But uh, yes, I have in in Peru. You know, we've had these situations with uh, uh, somebody elected a president who was. A profile that sadly reminds me of uh, of your current president, uh, and 
it was it was a struggle. You no, know? I was much younger, of course. You no, know? so it was a little it was limited to what I can do. But I started teaching relatively soon. I remember I was pretty young when I started teaching at a university, and I remember being talking to my students about the political situation that had nothing to do with the course I was teaching, you no, know, and be aware that this that this is happening, you no, know, uh, and, and and having even well not a direct issue with the university, but uh, of course some students didn't agree with my my point of view, you no, know. uh, but I think we we have to do uh, whatever we can within our uh, our area of expertise or or uh, the little influence we might have uh, at some point. And, and I think it's important. It's important not to not to uh, uh, keep things to yourself, your opinions. I think our opinions are important uh, just because the, the the text we see on the back is, is part of, gives us, uh, how do you say, uh, support to this uh, theory, you know, because if, if Maybe that's why we are the enemy, you no know, professors, university professors are the enemy because um, we try to put uh, to remind people of uh, things that are important and how things should go on. You know, and from whatever institution we can, uh, and we have to do any, anything we can uh, as citizens, just as citizens in some times, some occasions, to prevent um, characters like this to uh, start to absorb uh, institutions and power and um, the situation I'm referring to in my home country is, uh, you know, that we had uh, Mr. Fujimori as a president, you know, who was elected, he was elected, but it was a, like a phony democracy, you know, and in the end, he was clearly a dictatorship. The last election he won was completely uh, fraud and people eventually started thinking maybe the last one he won was also a fraud, <laughs> a fraudulent election. Uh, and one of the things, for example, he did was he started to buy uh, newspapers. And um, so he, at one point, he controlled all the newspapers in the country, basically. Uh, and he controlled almost all the television channels. Of course, he had the state, the public uh, TV. Uh, and he started either directly purchasing or, or reaching some kind of arrangement with the owners, you know, in he paid millions of, uh, of dollars to to some to some people, so they would support him. So uh, we have to be as vig vigilant as possible, because um, to try to uh, at the, the least we can do is point out these situations when they're kind of obvious or when we discover anything. Uh, let people know what what is going around. You know, of course, the times were much different uh, because this was uh, in the nineteen nineties. So uh, we didn't have uh, all the information we have on, in on the internet, but also then again, we have a lot of uh, fake news on the internet. So it's uh, it's compensates. You no, know? we had much less sources of information, but um, we had probably less sources of, uh, of fake news, but it was also a predecessor of fake news because I remember, for example, there was uh, an, a candidate, I think we're straying a little bit off topic. <laughs> no, you're right <laughs> you on. Talk about Okay, well, so uh, I was just remembering, for example, there was this, um, uh, how do you say, the gathering of uh, opponents to Mr. Fukimori uh, right before the election, and uh, there was really a lot of people in that, and it was a very large square, and the the Fukimori, the pro Fukimori uh, uh, um, TV showed uh, they put a camera on the opposite side of the plaza where it seemed there was nobody. You no, know, because it was a very large plaza. So it, it from that from that angle, it looked pretty empty. You no, know? and then on a normal channel, the the only normal channel, the only channel that hadn't been bought by by Fukimori and his uh, and, and his people, were you could see a, a normal vision, and you could see that there was really really a lot of people in that uh, in that gathering. And this, uh, you know, this discussion is right on and we should actually um, afford and take the time to talk about that, to frame the built environment as being, you know, the embodiment of, of Zeitgeist and of what happens, or, you know, in, in society. And we could basically make this an own show and, and have you, Jay, join us on that one. And obviously for, I mean, we got, we got the United Nations here, right? We got a, you know, American, we got a Peruvian, we got a Colombian, we got a German. And some of us are, I mean, uh, 
aiming to be on Americans on top as I've been for some years and Martine through your wife you're in it and um, we had just had the discussion about reconsidering these things but that's um, <laughs> on another note so um, you know this this is really important to to talk about these things and as a German I was just recommending to Jay uh, a movie that I saw uh, when I was back over the summer that I'm hoping they're gonna bring it out in America soon and they have to dub it, but the, the tough thing is that the title is not really uh, translatable in the way the original is, and it's called Fura and Fafura. And what Fura is is clear, and Fafura means seducer. And the whole uh, movie is about what you were talking about, the propaganda and how you stage things. It's about Goebbels. And the beginning of the movie is an audio that they've been doing of Hitler without him knowing. And, and the the question is who is this and no one knows because no one ever heard him speak that way and then it went on into architecture and into the streets into the urban urban space urban place that we always talk about based on your rightly so um demand jay is when they were putting all the banners uh, you know into the streets and making it like everyone is you know behind him and the whole Albert Speer architecture around it to make things like look way more impressive than they were. It's it's the same thing basically everywhere. And I love your point, uh, Pedro, to say we have to speak up as professors. And of course, we do in a way that we say, dear emerging generation, feel safe. I'm not going to downgrade you. I'm not going to do anything to you. You can express whatever your opinion. This is about the, you know, about what six, seven years ago when I had to learn what um, America is for my citizenship, freedom of thought, freedom of speech. So we have to say, you know, and we will say anything you tell us, we're going to respect, but we're going to discuss it and we're going to discuss yeah. it in a, in a decent way, right? Uh, Martin, Martin that, that, that is super important. Uh, I think that there is, there is, uh, we need to talk, no, and, and we really need to genuinely try to understand why the people, even if we think it is not clever to vote for Trump, why the people voted for him in such an overwhelming way. You know? What do they think? Of course, conspiracy theories are powerful, but what is motivating these conspiracy theories? You know? Why a, a, an Hispanic person votes again, like for Trump against himself? You know? So it, it, is, it, is, it is interesting to... to to think about that, and and I think that uh, you you started uh, today talking about the uh, on United States, so we still try to we should still try to be united. I mean, to have the, the hard discussion, no, to hear the arguments that sometimes sometimes look absurd for us, and uh, and and to understand which are the real motivations for those arguments, no. Uh, yeah. When did things got wrong for? But what happened? No, uh, 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 why we we elected Donald Trump and and uh, by understanding that, I think it is a good way to to look forward, right? And I, I think with again our, uh, as you said, Pedro, our I try to avoid to say power because that's exactly what it shouldn't be, but you know the the the. Uh, I guess the opportunity we present for the emerging generation to uh, build their own opinion and to stand up for them in whatever way, because this like the three P's in the back there that we highlighted, you know, is is it's a paranoia to to think of us as being powerful as, you know, educators and you underestimate actually the power of the people, the emerging people, the young people. Who, if there are, if they're still encouraged and allowed to be critical thinkers, they actually have the power. And if you would have to be afraid of, these are the ones you have to be afraid of. And in many, you know, with all the darkest days in my own culture, I will always and increasingly be uh, proud of the last time when, you know, an authoritarian and autocratic system in the GDR was brought down by the little people. I mean, I had to learn by heart here, we the people, and these little people got together an entire, I mean, the majority in Germany basically said, this is this is bad, this is supposed to be uh, to go. And then the big people as Americans and Reagan and Gorbachev were basically then 
saying, I think these people are right. And we better don't, you know, do something that these people don't want. And it worked just fine, right? That's a good example. I mean, Martin, you were sending me along the lines of what you were saying. You tried to cheer me up in my moments of despair. Uh, you like John Oliver, the comedian guy, and he's way more than a comedian because he's right on. And and he, after he went through that sort of, you know, puppet um, team that 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 Trump is 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 recruiting there. He he gave examples of grassroots, right, of little people having been, uh, you know, elected and and against the political regime, against the grain, and and they they rise up and and again the the other guy I wanted to quote here, and this is why he's behind us here. Uh, this is this is one of us. This is another academic, a teacher, a professor. But what gives him more validity is actually that he comes from uh, the other side. We talked about Musk and Zuckerberg and Bezos not being very helpful for critical discourse. Uh, this guy here comes from the same side. He comes from venture capitalism. He made his money there and got pretty rich um, and uh, could be one of them, but he isn't. He actually went back to what we we're doing, to teaching at uh, NYU and actually very uh, um, honorably uh, uh, donates his, his salary back to the institution and to the students. And, um, and he's speaking up and he's, uh, he's encouraging young people. And he was interviewed per the question that you, Martin, raised. Uh, so why, what, what do people have on their mind? What are they worried about? And he cut an angle back to our discipline and profession and as you can already see it down there, he talks about, you know, why were certain uh, male representatives uh, for him? But he also then said it was also like single moms. And one thing really resonated with me that he said a single mom, a single mom of three where the daughters were out of the house and somewhere safe had jobs. But the son was in the basement and he was gaming and vaping. And she's worried about that son. And saying, okay, can I put him in the hands of Kamala? Maybe Kamala isn't, you know, powerful enough to 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 give him employment. That is one of the analyses of and and is he also uh, is she powerful enough? You know, maybe my son doesn't want to be, you know, an entrepreneur and small businesses. Maybe he just needs a corporate job. So where are these jobs and, and, and who of them can provide them shelter, housing? And there we go back, or we are in the midst of our topic, right? That if you could actually give people um, peace and comfort in terms of saying everyone is housed and everyone is sheltered. So dear single mom or dear son, single dad, or you are the provider for the family, you wouldn't have to worry about your kids being uh, housed, that would be maybe a good thing. And that's what we have been shedding a light on, Pedro, uh, in your adopted uh, culture of uh, Catalonia and in, in Barcelona, because we were so impressed and will continue to be impressed that that has been happening. And, you know, the fourth one of us behind the scenes, Jay is the one who can associate best because he has been in your city, your guy's city, because you both, Martin, you've lived there for a year as a student. Pedro, you've been living there for the last 20 years. But Jay has been there uh, in 1965 before he blessed us to come here. So he has seen it under an autocratic authoritarian system that also isn't anymore, right? So that, again, I've been quoting uh, Kenneth Frampton, the great American uh, historian and theoretician, who had said the future of architecture as being human humane architecture is not within these cultures who are leading, who are superior, who are developed. That includes Americans and Germans. Bummer for me. Uh, be, and you can say maybe that East German part is an exception to that rule. But um, it is true that in, in architecture, the most movements, the most progression actually comes from this culture. May it be Chile, may it be one over Portugal, Jay, your favorite. Uh, 
uh, might it be Vietnam, which is still sort of officially under that a suppressive regime, but the architects basically say, we don't care. We do progressive stuff yeah. no matter what, right? And we don't let any regime get us, you know, off, off, off railed from that. So that's, again, is sort of bringing us back to the paradigm. So we were right on it already. And I think now in our post-traumatic trauma situation getting out of this this the continuation of the show can be really really continue to be very helpful you guys yeah agree? martin also that brings me uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, a reflection about uh housing about let's say non-monumental architecture in general no? also like small shops small initiatives even landscape manufacturing as uh, small workshops and of course like housing any kind of like self made or or community made uh, housing we are, we are, uh, in in barcelona uh, one of the some of the biggest most interesting examples of of architecture are not monumental architecture are also housing and and uh, and how people uh, uh, just get together in a community or just a small developer and and is promoting uh, uh, the development of of Houses like like architecture for people, not architecture for representing, uh, a, let's say a, a, a higher uh, idea or a higher uh, character or, or whatever. And with that, it's monumental to the people, right? Yeah, yeah. So they're monuments to the people, and again, this is where we left off to the left. There, this is the project we looked into Laborda last last time, and we said there's something. Uh, along the same lines going on just across the, the street. And you couldn't say across the street, a, across the alleyway or the pathway, the gravel path or whatever you want to call that. And so here is here is the context, right, that you were talking about. This is basically the street with you see a bench, you see a person sitting there, you see a lot of mopeds, you see, you know, public workers you see basically life, right? This is what, Jay, you always say, architecture is where we live. This is just a people street. And, um, and then you're out in the public. But then, of course, um, there is privacy. So you got to be housed and sheltered. Again, to remind us, the climate is not quite as super privileged as we have it here, but as close as possible as you can get it in Europe. So you don't get a frostbite in the winter time. It just gets kind of damp and chilly, you know, coming up soon, uh, Pedro, for you. But, you know, it's still above freezing and uh, you have you have a better chance to, if you bundle up a little bit, you can basically make it. So this is the project next door. And I just want to point out, I mean, this is, again, this is not uh, private housing or, or, or basically, uh, you know, outrageous monumental um, you know, Howard Yuzi, high-rise housing for the rich people. This is for the for the general people. And, you know, you can say for the little people and you can already say, see there, there's an attention to detail as we like to call these wallpaper doors where you give it the same kind of profile than the wall has. So this kind of fluted, kind of ribbed and they basically continue that over. And us coming from practice, this is quite some effort. This is not like throwing the usual, you know, cheapest door in there. This actually takes some effort and some extra expense to do that. And they do that. And, and they pay this attention to detail. Everything is of, 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 of kind of low budget, as you would call it, um, you know. Um, uh, but once you come into the central space that we've been talking a lot about courtyards, here we go again. That theme is incorporated here you get a very nice communal center space that has, um, that has vegetation. And um, you'd be surprised because for us in Hawaii, it's like, oh, we would want that too. And we already have it. This is going to hmm. be in the book. This is the Kaimuki Jade. Isn't this funny? Yes, Pedro. I mean, it looks like the same. But yours is contemporary uh, from some few years ago. Uh, this is all footage from my trip when, before we had gotten to know each other this uh, concluding year in the summer, we got to know each other because you were 
guiding me, the architect, you, the architect, for your organization, guiding architects. But this when I was first there with Joey, who was there uh, in 2021, and that project was fairly recent. So this is the Kaimaki Jade. It's going to be in the book. It's almost the same. This is from the 60s. And so we had it, but we lost it. So we need you. We need you guys to get it back, so to speak. <laughs> That's, so let's take a closer look at the project. And again, Pedro, you know it the most because it's in your city. It's in your hood. So you know all these projects way better than we do. So while we might sort of romanticize about them or fantasize about them, you know, you got you got the more sort of like reality check kind of, you know, citizen and less sort of, um, again, romanticized, as I admit, certainly my views are. But um, so please let us know what you think. But my observation is, again, this is simple steel, galvanized steel, no powder coating on them. It does the job. And these are simple T profiles that you just, you know, take one leg away uh, at times, and then you create this very interesting sort of a, um, a, um, a, a, you know, a, as we called it here in the in the show with Desoto, we called it sun slated Hawaii. So it could have shading function, but in this case here, it actually has privacy function. That somewhere where it gets denser, you can actually have things like your smelly sneakers or your laundry rack behind it that otherwise wouldn't maybe be, you got the laundry on the, by the way here, right? Every, every apartment building here has, has dryers. This is, this is the, the biggest energy hog we talked about, you know, that you could yeah. have. We got the trade winds dryer here that we should exclusively use, but the standard of any building here, even so-called a wannabe social housing and here you just do it, right? You just hang your laundry out there. And this is a, a hopefully the fire marshal approved that. And what's left, you know, is still wide enough to get by, you know, uh, for the safety purpose. But other than that, this is real life, right? This is Jay quoting Jay. Architecture is where we live. And, you know, having, you know, sneakers to gas out and having our laundry to be, uh, you know, clean again is part of life. Yeah, also related to that, how uh, uh, important is to, for example, build the washing space uh, as a communal space. You save a lot of space inside the apartments, and then you build a, a, a space in the building that is also a space for encounter, en encounter and, uh, and dialogue. Sometimes there are problems because the person that came before, again, talking about... Uh, 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 politics no how much do you uh, what, what is uh, sorry it is uh, what is the american dream like just caring about myself or living in a community that is caring care, that is, that is taking care of me no so uh, if we share the washing machine we can uh, 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 start building a community no and then i save a lot of space inside inside, inside my apartment to 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 enjoy uh, Pedro, how are these projects perceived within the city? Well, uh, I think there is a, a perception that uh, a lot of people just mm, are worried about not being enough of them, because especially social housing. You know, we we were talking about this last uh, last time, and we mentioned that there is, in, in spite of efforts of the the government, the local, both the, the regional government, the state government, etc. There's still this is still a big issue, and we were talking. I think there was some uh, a demonstration uh, that was right before we, uh, the the last time we spoke. I don't recall if, if, if this was you no know, that had happened of people complaining about the the situation. So, but besides this, this fact that that um, these projects might not be sufficient uh, because of a quantity thing, because we need more of these. Uh, I think in general there's a, there is a perception that there is um, relatively good quality. Uh, housing in general, and uh, particularly in in social housing, because social housing is, of course, uh, we tend to think of it as the last uh, resource or the last. Uh, the, it should be it, you expect it to be the worst, and it, there's no reason for this. It it doesn't have to be the worst, not not by not by far. I mean, you do have to uh, consider, of course, uh, the economy and how much you're going to spend. 
and the materials and the finishings and all of these kind of things are important to take into account. But this, uh, what the images you're showing, I'm not, don't remember exactly if this is a, technically a social housing project, but in any case, it doesn't seem to be particularly expensive either. No, it's not. It's clearly not a, a high uh, class, uh, high end uh, building. No, and I think it's a it's a nice example of how you can do with relatively little resources and um, not too expensive resources. You can do a very nice design and something that can be very pleasant to people and taken into account. When you see this kind of thing, for example, the the laundry, the bicycle, and all of these things, it gives you a sense of people really appropriating uh, the the public areas of of the building, and I think this is very important. And it, it's interesting because I was uh, not long ago I went to visit a project. I, I've had heard a lot about it, but I've never actually visited. Uh, there's a very interesting project from the 1930s here in Barcelona that's called the the Casa Block, the the Block House. Uh, by a series of architects, among them, uh, Mr. Josep Sert. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. He was, uh, well, <laughs> probably yes, because he was uh, very important in the US too. No, he was the Dean of Architecture in, in Harvard, if I recall correctly. Uh, he was a Catalan architect. And before he went into exile, um, uh, before the Civil War, he participated in this project. And one of the things, for example, that was interesting about this project is that they did like deliberately wide corridors to access the building uh, to encourage people to use the space. And even I would say that they're even a little wider than the ones we see in this project. So uh, they could become like gathering places for people. No, this was a very early social housing. It was probably one of the first social housing projects done in Barcelona and, and, and in Europe in general. Um, and uh, it's it's pretty interesting. It's actually it's still working. Uh, that's another interesting thing. It's still working as a social housing project, uh, almost a hundred years after. And it's a great piece of architecture. You no, know? and we see that uh, some of these ideas are not that new, actually. You no, know? they we we tune them up a little bit. We uh, the details are not the same. You no, know? but there are some very interesting concepts that we can rescue from projects back then. And that we just need to make some adjustments and some small improvements, and we can have a great uh, architectural project that works perfectly for for these days. Absolutely. And while we're probably running out of time, but we go back and revisit this next time because there's another project to also look at. Again, per the points that you both made, I mean, it really doesn't take much. It actually needs thinking. And you know, these are several slits that you router through this wooden panel, which is not a lot of effort, but it makes a big difference because it's actually a climatic device and it's a social device because you can actually have uh, the, the door closed. So you have privacy, but you leave um, your fenestration, which is most likely a, a glass, you know, a floor, a door a window thing. You leave that one open and you're still getting the breeze through a natural ventilation and you're also still hearing. So if you're a father or a mother, the single ones, right? They're worried about their sons vaping in the basement and gaming, right? Uh, you would be less worried because that son can actually be out and about in the public space, right? And you could still have acoustical connection to them, right? Or your kids are younger. So there's a whole sort of layer of um, just understanding life and human activity and event as the basis for some very strategic, almost acupunctural, architectural um, interventions that really don't cost much, but they make a whole lot of a difference. And that's really the smartness of um, everything we've seen here. And we talked about it. And that's something, again, we should sort of rediscover here in Honolulu because again we had this all mid-century when Jay when you came you came at the right time I'm really jealous about you that you knew these times and along the lines we basically lost it and um, the one who cheered me up recently I mean I'm half Austrian or probably a quarter Austrian because of my grandparents on the mother's side and I was um, while, you know, Rambo is up uh, with Musk and having their Mar-a-Lago party and their macho, whatever is going on there. While then, um, you know, if we want to believe in that men have to be strong, I was revisiting Arnie um, back in California. 
uh, where he had an endorsed Kamala. So he's strong enough as a man, right, to believe a woman can lead. And he basically said, having been the governor of California, it got me increasingly upset about politics. And this is a little sort of readjusting what you said, Martin. But he says it also made me increasingly believe in policy and policy making. While politics is all about corruption and all about power games, but policy is really absolutely important. And policy should come from the bottom up and be a grassroots yep. movement as all of these projects are and everything we're talking that's underlaying Martin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Also, I what I have seen here to be optimistic in, in Hawaii, there, there are a lot of of policies that are driven by people and addressed and endorsed by the government. And so there is this double double way dialogue, no, through uh, people and politicians to generate public policies. Uh, for the good of the society, let's say. Uh, and again, I think Barcelona is a great example of a, a city that that was born again after, uh, I mean, there was a very flourishing period at the beginning of the last century, then dictatorship came, and then Barcelona is what Barcelona is today. And, and, and there are many examples, Medellin and some other cities in Colombia, what you were, you were talking about, Vietnam. And uh, so, so uh, th there is hope. <laughs> All right, I, let that be the perfect closing note for now and pick it up from there exactly in about two weeks because we're on that sort of bi-weekly uh, rhythm. So looking forward, guys, to see you back for that. And until then, keep up that spirit. Exactly. Bye-bye. <laughs>